After someone goes shopping, many of you might have to play this game. I know I have to play this game. Well, I don't play this game anymore. I used to have to play this game. My wife would go shopping and it never failed. She would come home and she would ask that question. Guess how much I paid for this? How many of you guys have to play this game, right? We all have to play this game to a certain extent. And we're supposed to guess. And Chandra finally got tired of me. Apparently, I don't play the game very well. Because... She would come home and she would ask me, guess how much I paid for this? Now, you have to understand, I grew up yard selling with my mother. So to me, I think a dime is what you should be paying for most things. So Sean would come home with this beautiful new item from the store, the TJ Maxx or Ross or wherever, and she'd have this wonderful item she was excited about that she had purchased for us, and she'd go, guess how much I paid? And she was all excited, and I would so underguess that it took away all the joy of how much she'd actually paid for that. Because in her mind, it kind of made it seem like I, she'd overpaid for it, according to me. Now, I love The Price is Right, but I'm horrible at it. I mean, I look at those, The Price is Right game, and I watch it, and I think to myself, oh, it's got to be that much, and I'm way off all the time. As much as I'd like to go on that show, I don't think I would do well if they were to call me up there, because I always underguess. And those rare occasions when I would guess more, I would guess far more than she had paid for the item. What you think would make her excited because that meant she got a screaming deal. But it didn't because she thought, well, he really has no clue. So I was never really good at that game. But do you realize in a lot of ways that same game is played when it comes to the gospel? Because one of the things that we, we, I, I've realized over my 21 years of service to the king is that there are many people who just don't believe how free the gospel is. They don't, free, they don't believe how good of a price it is. There are many nowadays who will try to pervert the gospel and they'll tell, you, tell someone that they, they if, you, if you go to someone and tell them that they can have the God of the universe come and indwell them, secure their soul, no longer to have to live in fear of death or eternal separation from God Almighty, and that they can have eternal life and an abundant life even now, and it will cost them only one lifetime payment of absolutely nothing. It's been paid for already. They think it's too good to be true, and they refuse to receive it. But I am convinced that it is... True that if we were to charge for the gospel, we would have a lot more converts. I know this must be the case because I see the televangelists all the time. And they're telling them, I mean, I think if I went out door knocking and I was evangelizing and I was sharing with people in town here and I went up and knocked on the door and I told them, listen, I have got good news for you. I have got a way that all of your sins, both past, present, and future, could be forgiven and that you can secure your place Stamp your ticket, buy that ticket right now into heaven. Guaranteed you're going to go to heaven. And that nobody can take that away from you, and it's only going to cost you $2,000. I bet I could make some money. Because people want it. But unfortunately, when we bring the truth of it, that the gospel is free, that what Jesus Christ has done for us is absolutely free, they kind of take it as no value. They don't really understand the value of it. We know those of us who have Jesus, our personal Savior, and those of us who will, we will understand, and hopefully we do understand, that we cannot pay for what has been done for us. And that we must give it in the same manner that it was given to us. Absolutely free. Matthew 10, 8 tells us, Freely ye have received, freely give. Now, sorry for such a long introduction. Let's look at our text together this morning. Romans chapter 3. Read verses 21 through 26 with me now, if you would. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all, upon, upon, excuse me, unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be the propitiation through faith in His blood to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. 
To declare, I say, at this time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus Christ. Remember, our first pa- the passage we ended off with last week, the last verse we ended with last week said, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. So what must we do to be justified? What does it mean to be justified? Well, we've all heard that saying at different points in our lives, justified. And when they make it, and I can't remember the, the English grammatical term for it, but basically where you make it a play on words and you're like, justified. Just if I'd never done it before. And really, in all honesty, that's a great description of the word justified. It means to render something innocent as it never happened. That's what justification is all about. You right now, if you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, sit here this morning justified, completely innocent of everything you have done, everything you will do. You sit here justified. That is a beautiful place to find yourself. I imagine there are many, 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 many people who go to court, criminal court, who wish that they could get up there and the judge would say to them, justified justified. Now, don't get me wrong. We, we pervert this word. We try to justify our own sins sometimes, don't we? Now, I would not have been so bad. I would not have done that if this person would only. And we try to justify our sin. We don't need to justify our sin. Our sin is deplorable. It is disgusting. It says in verse 23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. When we sin, there is no justification. It's short of the glory of God. The only justification for our sin is the justifier, the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the only one who can make us rendered innocent. He's the only one who can make us pure again, if you would. So, what must we do to be justified? If you are one who doesn't mind writing in your Bible, and I know there's some who don't, don't, don't like to do that, and so you don't have to, but if you are, would you look at verse 22 and take out your pen with me? There's a couple of phrases in here I want to, you to underline in verse 22. We have in verse 22 the gospel in a nutshell. In verse 22, as he goes on, the apostle says it this way. He says, even the righteousness of God, underline righteousness of God for me if you would. That means to be put back in a right with God. That's the righteousness of God. To be rendered pure, to be clean, to be holy, if you would. Even the righteousness of God, then which is by faith of Jesus Christ. Underline by faith of Jesus Christ. How do we get the righteousness of God? By the faith of Jesus Christ. And unto all and upon all them that believe. Underline upon all them that believe for me, please. So we get the righteousness of the God by the faith of Jesus Christ on all them that believe. That is the gospel. Right there in verse 22. If you know and no other passage when you're trying to share the gospel with somebody, remember Romans chapter 3 verse 22. That is the gospel. That you can be righteous in God's eyes through the faith of Jesus Christ upon all them that would believe. Upon all them that would believe. I do not believe the wording in our Bible is by chance. It is by design of the Holy Spirit. So notice there in the phrase about the faith of Jesus Christ. Notice the word faith of Jesus Christ. It doesn't faith in Jesus Christ, faith by Jesus Christ, it's faith of Jesus Christ. I want you to notice that word in particular. Righteousness is of God, faith is of the Son, Jesus Christ. Now, don't get me wrong, we must believe in Jesus Christ. But the faith that he has for us is of himself. It is of himself, it is his work not ours. In case you don't believe me, let's begin by looking at Galatians chapter 2 together. Turn with me to Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2, uh, we're going to pick it up at verse 11, uh, and we'll read through this story here. Paul comes to Peter at Antioch. He finds Peter doing uh, deplorable things, which is basically when the Jews aren't around, 
He acts like a Gentile. He goes and eats with the Gentiles. He sits with the Gentiles. He acts and behaves like a Gentile. But when the Jews show up, he separates himself from the Gentiles and goes and acts like a pious, rich little snot, if you would, and goes and sits with all the Jews. And he acts like, like, hey, you know what? I'm better than them. So much so that he was drawing away the other Jews who would not do so. Even Barnabas was drawn away by this. And that's what we read here. But there's also some more phrasing past that point. But just pick it up at verse 11 with me, if you would, and we'll read through verse 21 this morning. It says, But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to, his, to the face, because he was, he was to be blamed. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with this dissimulation. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, If thou, being a Jew, livest after the manner of Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? Okay, so there's that story I just told you about. Notice he's condemning him for his works of the flesh. That's what he's really doing right here. He's condemning him for the works of his flesh, for him trying to show his righteousness through the flesh. But then he gets into verse 15. We, who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Jesus Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. But if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves are also found sinners, is, therefore, is there therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I through the law am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if the righteousness come by law, then Christ is dead in vain. If Christ could have redeemed us any other way than the cross, he would have. He prayed that, didn't he? In the garden, he said, Father, if there's any other way, let this cup pass from me. But nevertheless, not mine will, but thine be done. Now we're talking about God the Son praying to God the Father, saying, if there's any way we can save these people, aside from me going to the cross, let's do it. If there was ever a prayer uttered in the history of the world, that should have been answered, it would have been that one. And it was answered. It was answered with the resounding, this is the only way. There isn't many ways to heaven. It doesn't matter how good of a person you are. Righteousness is not of the works of the flesh. It doesn't matter who you come from or where you've been. It doesn't matter what school you went to, how much you read your Bible. Don't get me wrong, all those things are important. But that's not what saves you. It is the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ and your belief in him. That is what is going to save us. It is not a matter of what I'm going to do. And that's what Paul goes through, and that's what he condemns Peter for doing, for trying to somehow show himself righteous through his actions. Don't get me wrong. He says we shouldn't frustrate the grace of God. In other words, we shouldn't take the grace of God and make it something a sinful thing. Well, I'm forgiven, so I'm going to go out and do whatever I want to do. No! No! But he says this, if you're doing that to try to prove yourself worthy to God, you are never going to make it. You're never going to make it. Look closely at verse 20 with me, if you would. He says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ live in me. And the life which now I live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Here's his point. He is saying this, that once we become a believer and we place our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, we believe in Jesus Christ as our Savior, we should let him, that indwelling spirit, 
live through us. That's how we fulfill the law. There are some who would argue with us, though. They would say, well, what about James? And we run into that one a lot in our area, don't we? James says to us that faith without works is dead. Well, that's the great verse for them to quote, but they're taking it out of context. Let's look at that context together real quick. James chapter 2. James chapter 2. We're going to take a look at this where they, we get this quote with all time. Faith without works is dead. So you have to have faith. You have to have works, excuse me, to be saved. They're taking this totally out of context. This is not what the apostle James, by the way, James is most likely the oldest Bible in the New, or oldest epistle in the New Testament. So we know that this is, that this is something they'd want to try, try to dis, dissuade or to pervert. Pick up a verse 14, if you would, in James chapter 2. Let's read through verse 26. It says, What doth it profit, my brethren? Though a, man may say, though a man say he hath faith and have not words, can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, notwithstanding, ye give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well, and the devils also believe and tremble. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest that thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith Abraham believed God and it was imputed to him for righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. I'm going to pause there for a second. Notice what it says there. It says that Abraham believed God. It was the belief that saved him and made him righteous. It wasn't his works. His works with his faith perfected it. And it goes on in verse 24. You see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she received the messengers had sent the, the, the messengers that, and had sent them out another way? For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. I will show you my faith by my works. My faith pre-exists my works. Do you see that? My faith pre-exists my works. It does not make my faith. My faith makes my works, not the other way around. And that's an important distinction because, guys, i got to tell you this. We, the Christian church, we, the believers in the Lord Jesus Christ and His completed work on the cross, are the only religion in the entire world that teaches it this way. You can go to any other false religion out there, and they're going to tell you, you must have works, and that is your faith. We are the exact opposite. That's how you can recognize a lie. And this is why I get so frustrated when the Christian church begins to try to pervert the gospel. Because why are we taking something... How many of you guys have heard that term, kiss? Keep it simple, stupid. Right? It is that. This is so simple, we need to keep it that way. But the problem is, is when we get along in our walk with Christ, we start to get a little, little bit, um, for lack of better terms, learned. We start to understand things more. We start to pervert it a little bit. We're like, oh, well, you must do it. No. Keep it simple. Faith of a child. I'm not going to sit down with a child and discuss the, the deeper things of the Lord right now. As they grow, we'll begin to discuss those things. And those things will not change the initial faith. This is what I love. Guys, I was a religious person prior to coming to know the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior. I always believed there was a God. Always believed there was a God. I studied with the Jehovah Witnesses. I actually went to a couple of Mormon services so I could play basketball at their church. Right? I mean, I went to all sorts of different religions looking for the truth. I went to Catholicism. That's what I grew up in. My family was all Catholic by heritage, right? Okay? I went to Catholicism. I went to all sorts of different religions that were out there trying to find truth. And when I heard the truth, it hit me up the side of the head like a bag of bricks. There was no question. 
What was the difference? Everybody else was telling me I have to be a good person. I knew me. I can't be a good person. So I was like, well, I guess I got to go to hell because I can't be a good person. And then, by the grace of God, some men showed me that it wasn't me that mattered. It was him and his completed work that mattered. That's what changed me. That's what converted me. Was because I now understood I did not have to perform. Now, mind you, I truly felt like I had a road to the master's experience. Once I became saved, Sean and I figured this out last night, December 9th, 1992, when I gave my life to the Lord Jesus Christ. When I became saved, I had that road to Damascus experience. I never turned back. I haven't looked back. I don't want to go back. And why was I so converted? Why was I so convinced? Because it was the only religion that spoke truth and told me it wasn't about me. It was about him and what he did. That's what changed my life. That's what converted me. It's the same thing that's going to convert them today. Don't get me wrong. I mean, there's all sorts of books written about how to witness to a Jehovah Witness, how to witness to Mormons, how to witness to Baha'i, how to witness to a Buddhist. You know why? We have the truth. Just take the gospel. Because that's what they all want. They want the truth. It doesn't matter if I can argue my way through a false religion. For a while on Wednesday nights, um, I, was, I was requested by some of the youth to, to start looking at some of the major world religions and what they believed. And so we began to do that. And you know what I noticed the fruit of it was? Self-righteousness. That's truly, honestly, what happened. We started studying the false religions of the world and what they believed. And, and, we, and we were supposed to be comparing it to what we believe in Christianity, which we were doing, don't get me wrong. But you know what? It made people go, Ooh, well, I'm something. Look at me. I believe the truth. No. It's what Jesus Christ did that made it something. So we stopped doing that. I didn't see the fruit from it that should be there. We should not have to go, oh, well, I hate an unbeliever. Really? You're better than our Lord? Our Lord loves the unbeliever. He died for the unbeliever. Just like he died for you before you believed. (sighs) Ephesians chapter 2, we quote this one all the time. If you want to look at it, you can. Ephesians chapter... um, Two, verses 8 through 10. We use this one all the time in our witnessing in this area. It says, uh, Ephesians chapter 2, the apostle writing says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Then he goes on, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained, that we should walk in them. I want you to notice there the structure. I know we've talked about this before, but it's very important to understand the structure of our Bible. It says, for by grace, in verse 8, for by grace are you saved through faith. And that, speaking of the faith, not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. Do you realize the faith alone is even a gift from God? That's why in the passages we're reading this morning, it says what? The faith of Jesus Christ. It's his work. What is our work in this whole thing? Tough one. Believe. Believe in Him. To believe in Him. I mean, is that not one of the world's most famous, famous passages comes from? Turn with me over to John while we're, while we're just kind of bouncing around with me. John chapter 3. You guys know this. Verse 16. But I want to read a little bit more of that if you would. So pick it up at verse 14 with me of John chapter 3. Uh, we're going to pick up at verse 14, and the Lord Jesus speaking and said, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believed on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Then this is the condemnation. The light has come into the world. Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. Now, here's the important part that I want to draw out of this, guys. 
We see in there that we have to believe in Jesus. Believe in Jesus. And in particular, I love the way that verse 18 says it. We quote verse 16 all the time. But look at verse 18 and the end there. He says, he says this, that he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. That word name is an amazing word. And we're familiar with this term and what it really means. A lot of people's last names are based off of what their families used to do, right? Carpenter, wonder what they used to do, right? Or maybe, you know, it's, it's Smith, right? What did they used to do, right? Or sometimes they shorten the Smith to black. Or maybe they go with the whole thing, those blacksmiths. But you know what I'm saying? We understand what that means. Your name carries some authority with it. It used to be in the old English, we understood our name carried authority with, it, authority with it. If I was to say, for example, I was John's son, that meant I carried the authority of John. I was his son. We understand that term, and that's what that term really means there in the name. Here's the point. Remember he said in James, even the devils believe. Right? They believe Jesus exists. The devil came up to him on the shoreline there in, in, uh, as he was walking around the Sea of Galilee and he said, don't cast me out. Right? Don't throw me out. It's not the point of time yet. You can't cast me out of darkness. It's, it's not time yet. They knew who he was. They knew what authority he had. They believed in him. But the problem is, they just believed that he existed. It's not enough just to believe that Jesus existed. By the way, there's more evidences for the fact that Jesus Christ existed than, than there is most of the Caesars. Did you know that? There's more evidence that Jesus Christ existed than there are for most of the Caesars. But it's not just enough just to believe that he existed. It means to believe in the authority that he said he had. He said, look it, I am the Son of God. He said, I am the I am. I am God. He said, I can take away your sins. It's an, you have to believe in that authority of who he is. Of who he is. That's the belief. The faith is his. He gives us the faith to believe. And he's so great about it that he even says, you know what, I'm not going to leave you alone right there. I'm going to give you the spirit to indwell you. That you, once you place your faith, you place your belief in me, I'm going to give you something to make you happy, something that's going to help you get over those struggles and those difficulties and those hard times that you have. He says, I'm going to give you the faith. He's given it. He's given it. It's a gift. What did God give to us? His only begotten son. We know what the gift is. And we understand what a gift is all about. But here's the problem. A gift can just sit there and be a gift and never be opened and never be used for its intended purpose. We just got back um, some gifts that we'd given to some people for Christmas. I know that sounds crazy. It wasn't re-gifting. They were still wrapped in our wrapping. They never opened them. All right? Um, and it wasn't like they gave them back to us as a slap in our face. There's a whole long thing. You know, her grandmother passed, Sean's grandmother passed away. The gifts never got some of the stuff. So we wrapped them back up. We'll re-gift them to somebody else, perhaps some of you. All right? <laughs> But, all right, but just because those gifts sat there being unused and being unopened didn't make them not a gift. They were a gift. So if you're an unbeliever, you can sit there and have that gift sitting right in front of you for year after year after year and never take that gift, never open it up, and never use it for its intended purpose. Doesn't mean it's not a gift. It doesn't mean he didn't give it. It's still there. But if you're a believer... Maybe you take that gift, you go home, and you set it down on your coffee table. And maybe you even open it up, and you pull out whatever on the inside of it, and then you leave it sitting there. It's your gift. You received it. You believe it's a gift. You even open the gift, but you're not using it for its intended purpose. You're just letting it sit there. There's a, there, there's a danger in both. So, first to you who believe, not. Believe is to have faith 
in Jesus. It is our faith that is to place your trust in who he is and his completed work on the cross. If you're a believer, to believe is to, is to, is to no longer try to prove your worth or perhaps try to overcome your struggles in this world on your own, the temptations thereof, but allowing the Spirit of God, which you opened up and allowed to come in, to overcome for you. That's what it's about. You're already in John. Just flip over to John chapter 10. This is, this is for the believer now. If you're an unbeliever here, you don't get to experience this yet, but you can simply by placing your, your belief in the Lord Jesus Christ. John chapter 10, verses 7 through 15. Follow along with me if you would. It's a, it's a parable, or a description that we we're familiar with from Jesus Christ. He says in verse 7, Then Jesus said unto them again, Verily, verily, and, I, and by the way, I don't know how many guys ever stop. When he says verily, right, and he says verily twice, it means basically pay attention. All right? I'm putting that in my own vernacular for you. All right? I mean, it's like if you were to say to somebody, hey, listen. No, seriously, listen to me. All right? That's kind of what he's doing right here. So what he's about to say must be important. He says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever come before are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief come not, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But he that is a hireling and not, a, not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming and leaveth the sheep and fleeth, and the wolf catcheth them and scattereth the sheep. The hireling fleeth because he is a hireling and careth not for the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and know my sheep, and am known of mine. As the Father knows me, even so I know I the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. All right. But I want you to catch something right in the middle there. Pick up a verse 10 with me, if you would. The thief comes not but, to to, but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and they might have it more abundantly. More abundantly. Brothers and sisters, do you realize that he wants you to have a good life? Even right now? Oh, but why does he give me trials? Why does he give me difficulties? Why does he make it so hard? Because he's trying to give you a better life. One that trusts more in Him. One that believes, if you would, more in Him and His authority. He's trying to get you to take off everything that you're carrying around for yourself and put it upon Him. He's trying to give you a better life. And He says He wants to give you life and more abundant. That's super exceeding. That's beyond. Now that can speak of our eternal life. We know that we have eternal life. Never to have to be afraid. If you're a believer, you put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, you understand that you can never get that taken away from you. You can't even take it away. It's yours. It belongs to you, and you will have that life eternal, and it will be amazing. You know, I don't know a whole lot about heaven. And there's a bunch of books written about heaven. There's even movies coming out about what heaven's supposed to be like, right? But you know what I know? about heaven is that I know 100% I am not going to be disappointed. I'm not going to be upset in my belief in the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not going to get there and go, oh, really? This is as good as it gets? I did all that for this? I'm not going to have that problem. I'm not going to worry about that because you know what? I know that it is beyond what I can even begin to imagine. Paul, when he was one time starting to describe heaven, said he can't even begin to utter because to do so would be unlawful. What would make it unlawful? Was it the fact that God said, don't tell them? I don't think so. I think what makes it unlawful is he could do it no justice as to how amazing it is. But he also wants you to have an abundant life right now. I want you to notice after he says this, he says in verse, right before he says this, in verse 9 he says this, I am the door. If by, me, if by me any man enter in, he shall be saved, and he shall go in and out and find pasture. 
What's the point? Does that mean you go in and out of heaven? No. Does that mean that you go in and out of faith in Jesus Christ? No. It means that you go in for refuge and safety in him, and then he sends you back out into the world. You share the gospel, and you come back in to get fed again. That's the point. We can go out into the world as believers and not be afraid. That's the point. Those sheep were able to go out into the field knowing that their good shepherd was going to take care of them. Going to lead them to the pasture that mattered. Lead them to where they need to be. And they were to come back in for the safety at night and the refuge of the, of the fold. That's what we have. That's what we have right now. I wish we would just live this more abundant, this quantity and quality of life that he desires for us. Let me share another time that this more abundantly phrase is used, though, if you would. I think we've got time. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. The Apostle Paul writing this time. Ephesians chapter 3. We're going to pick it up at verse 14. Apostle Paul writing to the church of Ephesus says this. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family of heaven and earth is named that he would grant unto you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with the might of his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, the length, and the depth, and the height, and to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in the church by, G by Christ Jesus throughout all the ages, world without end. Amen. He says to us that he wants to give us a love that passes knowledge, that we might be filled with all the fullness of God, that he wants to do exceedingly above all that we can ask or think according to the power that he can work through us and in us by the Holy Spirit. That sounds like an abundant life. That sounds like something we should desire and want. But sometimes we get distracted. We get worried about the cares and the concerns of this world. I stubbed my toe, so I'm going to be angry. Right? Get frustrated over the little things, and we allow that to steal our joy. We get frustrated over the big things, and we allow that to steal a lot more. He wants us to have an abundant life. This is the point of our faith. What we offer to the world, guys, is unlike anything else. Because I don't have to worry about whether or not I'm going to make it to heaven because of me. So that gives me the freedom to live according to him, to the best of my ability, through the power of the Holy Spirit which resides in me. I don't have to worry about it. I don't have to worry, am I good enough? Because guess what? I know I'm not. But he is. And he dwells me and dwells me. He lives through me. That's what makes it good enough. That's what justifies me. Not me. Not my works. Not anything I can do or prove or show forth is worthy of what God has done for me. Turn back to our text now this morning. You thought we were never going to end up there again, but, I told, but we will. Verse 24, he says it this way. Romans chapter 3, verse 24, he says, Being justified freely by his grace through redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And then he goes on from there. Whom God has set forth, and we're going to read all the way through the end together now. Whom God has set forth to be the propitiation through faith in his blood. To declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say, at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It is excluded by what? Law of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude, a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Is he the God of the Jews only? 
Is he not also the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. Seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith and the uncircumcision through faith. Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid, yea, we establish it. We've covered all this, I think, thoroughly this morning in our study of what this is really talking about with all the passages we turn to. But before I end this morning, I want to come to one of the books that I tend to gravitate toward when I really want to hear from God. Turn with me to 1 John, if you would, 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. J. Vernon McGee one time uh, said that if, if he's ever starting at a new church, preaching at a new church, he always starts in the book of 1 John. And I don't know how many of you guys have actually ever taken the time to read the book of 1 John. I hope each and every one of you have. But if you haven't, go home this afternoon and do it. It doesn't take very long. But go home this afternoon. If there was ever a book that should encourage us as believers, it is 1 John. The whole Bible should. But 1 John just speaks really well to my heart. First of all, let's look at 1 John chapter 2, verses 1, through two, 1 and 2. He writes, the Apostle John writes, My little children, these things write unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation of our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. I want to pause, I want to stop there on this passage. We're going to look at another one here just further down in a second, but I, w- I want you to, or further over in a second, but I want you to notice here, he says, if we sin, we have an advocate. We know what an advocate it is. It's one who stands up in court for us, right? A couple of weeks ago, after we went out for our last youth boating activity, we had one of our young people who had picked up a fishing pole who didn't have a license and just so happened a fishing game officer came by and, and ticketed the young man. And uh, I went to court with him. Uh, you can't just pay the ticket. I guess when you're a juvenile, any ticket you get, you have to go to court. I don't know why they do that, but they do. Right? If you're an adult, you can just go down and pay the fine and be done. But as a, child, as a juvenile, you have to go to court. And so I went to court with him on his date. And I stood there. And myself and, 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 and Miss Hawk came down there. And we both stood up as a character witness for this young man. That he was not really trying to do anything ill-gotten. He was a high-functioning autistic young man that we, we appreciate a lot, and he's a great kid, and I, I mean, I love him, he's sweet as to death, but he was so worried over getting a fishing ticket for not having a license. I mean, he was so repentant, it was ridiculous. And we stood up in front of that judge, and we both got the opportunity to kind of give our own testimony to who he was and, and what our concern was and stuff. And you know, it necessarily didn't do any good, he still had to pay a fine and all that fun stuff. But I kind of for that first time there, thought, as I was sitting in that courtroom, and it's been a long time since I've been in the courtroom, okay? As I stood in that, I mean, I should say, it's been a long time since I've been in the courtroom as, like, somebody has a judge talking to you and you're not, the, you're not a lawyer or something like that, right? I mean, I practice a lot in the tribes, and that's a little bit different because I get to go there and make my arguments. But I stood there, basically, if you would, as an accused with him. And I, as I sat there and I thought about this, I thought about the day we stand before our Savior, And how beautiful those words are going to be. That when I walk in there, and I know my hands are bloody, they have nothing, in in my flesh is nothing but unrighteousness. And I, I, I sit there and I think to myself, and you know how wonderful it's going to be? That my lawyer, the Lord Jesus Christ, God the Son, is going to stand up and look at his father and say, hey, this one's justified. This one's justified. I'm going to cry. I know I'm going to cry. Because I know what's in me. But he's going to stand in my gap. He's going to stand in my place. And he's going to cry out justified. As he holds out his hands that have the holes in it. And his head that has the scars. And his back that's been torn open. Justified. Just if I'd never done those things. Just if I'd never done those things. Because he's the propitiation for. And this is honestly one of the things that I love it. Don't get me wrong. But he says this in verse 2. He says that he's the propitiation for our sins. Hopefully in your Bible, there's a colon there. That's a new thought after that point. The apostle's real thought to begin with was this. He's the propitiation for your sin. Personal. You. You individually. Yes, he died for the whole world. 
But and I've shared this with you before. I am convinced if I would have been the only one, he still would have done it. He died for you. As you're still in 1 John, flip over to chapter 4 with me if you would. 1 John chapter 4. And let's just go ahead and read verses. Uh, we'll pick it up at verse 7, only through 7 through 11. It says this, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. In this was manifested the love of God, love of God toward us, because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through Him. Here in His love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the perpetuation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. God so loved us. God so loved you that he sent his son. God so loved you that he sent his son. That he could be the propitiation, the payment for your sin. That he could be the justifier of you. The one who stands in the gap when we should be condemned to hell and says, this one's mine. That's how much God loves you. So much so that he was willing to separate himself for a moment in time to pay for your sin. What is the most loving act that anyone could possibly do? Greater love hath no man than he lay down his life. What is the most loving act you and I can do for an unbelieving or a believer in this world? It's to sacrifice our life. It is to give it up to our Savior and let Him use us however He desires to use us. I'll do that if, no, I love the prophet. Here I am, Lord, send me. He didn't say, send me if you provide me with extra money. Send me as long as it's going to be easy. Send me. So, we'll close with our text, though. I read over it quickly, but I want to look back now at our text again, and I want to close with this thought from the Apostle from our text. Look at verse 28 again of Romans chapter 3 with me. He says this, Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. What saves? Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and His completed work on the cross.